For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a membership organization devoted to promoting the use of native plants to create sustainable landscapes. We carry out our mission through educational programs and provide resources such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, Seeds for Education Grants, and other educational webinars. At the local level, Wild Ones chapters deliver area programs, including garden tours, speakers, conferences, and seed exchanges. If you are not a Wild Ones member, we hope you join us and take advantage of the camaraderie and support that come with being a part of a local chapter. Our critical mission needs you. Wild Ones chapters, our members put mission into action. We get our hands dirty and learn by doing. Chapters are actively recruiting officers and volunteers to plan upcoming events. Chapter activities require the time and talents of many different people to coordinate. Amplify the impact you have on the native plant movement by sharing your skills and enthusiasm with others. Please reach out to your local chapter to find out how you can get involved. If there isn't a chapter near you, now's the time to consider starting a Wild One Seedling chapter. Chapter founders across the country connect and collaborate with one another for mutual support and guidance. If you are eager to advance the mission and cultivate support for native plants in your area, visit the Start a Chapter page on the Wild Ones website. Wild Ones inspires people and communities across the country to transform home landscapes into vibrant and essential habitats for all forms of life. Programs like this would not be possible without generous support from our members, donors, and folks like you attending Wild Ones programs. Please consider donating to Wild Ones today by visiting donate.wildones.org. Hi. And thank you for joining us for the Wild Ones Native Garden Design Series. My name is Michelle Hensey, and I'll be your host for this discussion. I have been a Wild Ones member since 2021 and will be stepping into the role of Vice President on the Wild Ones Board of Directors in 2023. I'm honored to be talking with Lisa McDonald Haynes, the designer of the Wild Ones Princeton Native Garden Design for an urban multifamily dwelling. This is the first in our series for design of a home of this type and a property of this type. Wild Ones Native Garden Designs follow the premise that native plant landscaping can be beautiful, beneficial, and achievable for gardeners of all skill sets in terms of scope and budget. Our Native Garden Design website includes information on how to get started by identifying your echo region, selecting and determining the right plant for the right place, considering your garden's climate conditions and finding local native plant nurseries in your area. The design we're sharing today joins a growing number of free downloadable native garden designs created by professional landscape designers representing various echo regions in the United States. A plant list accompanies each design, highlighting the diversity and beauty of the native plants selected. Also included are designer notes, which outline a phased approach to installation. All these materials can be downloaded and printed easily at home. All designs focus on the use of native plants that provide habitat and food for wildlife, while adding color and beauty to your garden throughout the seasons. We hope these resources inspire, encourage, and motivate you on your native garden journey. We are honored to have designer Lisa McDonald Haynes here today. Lisa McDonald Haynes is a registered landscape architect, co-owner operator of Redbud Native Plant Nursery, and a founding principal of Tend Landscape Architects. With a land ethic formed from her family's farming heritage and more than 20 years of professional landscape work, Lisa's focus is fostering connections between people and their environments and improving quality of life by altering how we perceive, use, and care lands for our landscapes. Educated at Purdue University with a Bachelor's of Science in Landscape Architecture, Lisa has worked directly with community groups, municipal agencies, and a wide range of design professionals and private homeowners in cultivating landscapes like our health depends on it. 
Lisa, would you like to say a few words or introduce yourself? Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for, for having me. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, this has been an exciting design process for us to think outside the box in a way, to think about something that can be both specific and something that can be, you know, a general template in a way. And, and I do hope that this is um, widely adoptable, uh, adaptable um, for a lot of people, you know, to use. And so I, I will say that, that I hope that people look at it as take what fits for you, take what speaks to you. You can apply it on a lot of different landscapes, a lot of different ways. Um, and I and I do hope that's useful. And I do want to also acknowledge that um, that I'm representing a larger team. So I just want to shout out that my business partner, Julie Snell, will be doing a second um, discussion um, on a different type of property for the Princeton area. Um, and also Gretchen Trustney and uh, Angie Diaz within um, within our studio, 10 Landscape Architects um, assisted on, on this. Wonderful, thank you. Lisa, for those of us less familiar with the Princeton area, maps are always helpful for me. <laughs> Would you please share what typical weather and climate conditions um, are experienced in this area, touching on seasons, temperatures, weather patterns, things that impact the design? Yeah, so the, the, the weather patterns for the mid-Atlantic region, which is, is a part of um, New Jersey, parts of Pennsylvania, down into Baltimore, DC, um, you get a little bit of the coastal you know, influence and you can see that on the map, you know, on the screen, you're getting a little bit of coastal influence, but then we're right up against the mountains too. So Princeton is really setting um, in the Piedmont area. Um, you get true four season um, in the Princeton area. So you're, you're definitely getting a winter and you're definitely getting spring, summer, fall. Um, and I think that's um, one of the, the great things about it. You do get those true uh, four seasons. Um, we do have a true winter, less and less so, but you know, you might have, you know, lows in the tens, twenties, and you might have highs in the 30s and 40s. And then in the summer, you might have weather that's, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Um, like I said, that's, that's changing a, a little bit with climate change, but um, true four seasons. Um, we get a lot of rain um, within our area, um, at least 45 inches or so a year. Again, that's changing. We're getting more, more precipitation um, on the East Coast. One thing to note if, as a gardener in this zone is, um, that the Princeton area is right on that interchange um, between, like I said, the coastal plain and the, and the mountains. We're in the Piedmont zone. So we're right at that um, winter transition between um, precipitation being truly wet and being you know, more frozen. So that may affect your planting choices. Um, you don't wanna necessarily get something maybe that's too weak wooded if we start to have more ice um, in that kind of transition zone um, in the winter. So, um, could speak a little bit about what it's been, what it, the assumed you know changes are going to be, but um, it's a fabulous climate, honestly, for gardening. Excellent, thank you. What um, in this echo region? You may have touched on this with that response, but what factors are priority in order for a garden to thrive, considering that and and other elements? So definitely working with your particular place. Um, like I was mentioning, you may be trending a little bit more towards the coastal plain um, if you're in the in the um, Princeton area. Maybe that would imply that you have more silty or sandy soils. Maybe you're getting a little bit more kind of ocean effect um, that's holding the temperatures a little bit more steady. So really, I guess, start with knowing, you know, your individual spot. Do the investigation. There's lots of websites out there where you can really drill down, you know, into your eco region. Um, you can drill down into things um, like the, the type of precipitation that you're likely to expect. So I would just do your homework, you know, on that um, and really drill down and, and make your garden fit your actual spot. Even though you might say Princeton, it might be different from one side of Princeton, you know, to the, you know, to the other side, you might be in a little bit more of a valley. Um, and in some, you know, areas in Princeton, around Princeton, you might be a little bit more of a ridge. So that may change um, temperature that may change, wind pattern, things like that. Okay, you touched a bit on um, 
climate change in your comments. Most of the US has experienced some degree of climate change in the last uh, decade or so. And what type of climate changes have you observed in the Princeton area over that time? More water and higher temperatures are the basics. Um, but the, the thing I think that's maybe most applicable to pay attention to are the variability. That's what I'm noticing most as a gardener. Um, I grew up in, in the plains in the US and I was used to like wide swings within temperature within you know a couple of hours, within one day. I never experienced that in the mid-Atlantic region until, until more recently. Um, so I, I, as a gardener, you may have to kind of watch those like high variability, high swings um, with temperature, especially in those shoulder seasons. If you're kind of getting close, you know, to, to spring last frost time and the, and the gotten warm and, you know, the, the, the plants have pushed and the buds are, you know, coming out and you don't want that to freeze. So I would say, yes, plan on higher temperatures. Yes, plan on um, more precipitation, but try and work around that variability. Um, of temperature um, within the day, it may warm up too quickly, you know, early in the spring, the plants get a little bit confused. And that's definitely um, why you want to stick with natives. I've, I've definitely noticed that um, Asian plants, um, I know that a lot, like sometimes if I say the word magnolia <laughs> to people, they say, oh, I hate that. That's the one that like looks like Pepto-Bismol, you know, spilled all over the ground because the flowers come up, you know, for one day and then a frost happens and they're all over the ground. Well, that's, the, that's an Asian variety of magnolia. If you go with one of our native um, magnolias, they, they have more um, flexibility, um, more accustomed to the temperature here. So even as things are changing with climate, stick with the native plants, they're gonna be more adaptable. They're gonna perform better for you. Um, so yeah, plan on, plan on more water, plan for that, plan on higher temperatures. Um, that may affect the humidity um, in our zone. You maybe have more things like powdery mildew, things like that. So that may you know, affect your plant choice, even with the natives. That may just, you wanna give them more space. So there's more, more air circulation, things like that. Thank you. That was a great example with the uh, magnolia. That was always my thought about the one that was in our prior property until I realized it wasn't the native magnolia. And with the design, Lisa, and considering climate change, can you share a bit more about the qualities of the native plants you chose, other plants in this design that would help to mitigate some of those climate uh, challenges that we're having in this area? Yeah, and it's gonna, even though this, um, this template is a little bit different than some of the other ones um, in, the, in the template from Wild Ones, it's about the same square footage but we tried to plan for a wide variability across um, across this lot. So things in the front yard, um, they're going to be drier. They're going to take more, you know, kind of blasting sun um, in the late in the late in the afternoon, later in the day. Um, things that are kind of against, you know, driveway. Maybe it's more reflected heat. Things like that. And then once you get into the backyard, hopefully it's temperature cooling a little bit. You get a little bit more shade. So hopefully there's there's pieces across even this you know, small template um, that you can draw for, for those different climate conditions that you may be dealing with in your garden. Um, so definitely the front yard, we planned on it being a little bit drier, a little bit more sun, same on the side yard. And then as you get into the back, a little bit more water retention in those soils, a um, little bit more cooler temperatures, um, shade, things like that. Smart. Okay. Can you share a bit more about your approach to developing the design and touch on what you feel are some of the key features? Absolutely. So we wanted the, the template to really speak um, to our region, um, speak to the type of development um, that you experience in the mid-Atlantic um, area and um, have it show a little bit different. I know that the, the template and, and a lot of the other um, wild one cities, you know, may speak to that, you know, region. It, it felt a little suburban um, to us, and we wanted to to change it up a little bit to make it more urban um, and more dense. So that's what you're going to see, you know, in this template. Um, yeah, it's beautiful. It seems like um, 
you've minimized uh, turf lawn and focused on the the beauty of the landscape in a small space that you know anyone living on the property it's it's designated as multifamily could enjoy. Right. So again, yes, we wanted to make it very typical to you know types of living types of development that we see around us. So definitely the the multifamily was key. Uh, working within a smaller template um, was key. But I guess when someone is starting a, a garden design for themselves, again, kind of fitting it to your, to your site, to your needs, I would encourage you to step back for a minute and do a little bit of bigger thinking, do a little bit of goal planning. You know, how do I, how, what are the, the functionality things that I have to have, you know, in here? Um, so the example might be, I want to go ahead and keep some some parking, you know, on my lot, not a lot of urban lots have that. And that's a bonus, you know, you don't have to park on the street here. So, so that would be a functionality. Another functionality would be how does each um, resident need to best approach their door? So, you know, we planned that for the front, um, front resident to go into the front. We planned for the um, resident in the back of the property going in that side door and that everybody could use the backyard. So the other functionality things were, where does the trash and the recycling, you know, need to go? How's it going to be most um, applicable for everyone to access? How are you going to get it out to street on, you know, trash pickup day? But also in this um, area, Princeton is a college town, you know, maybe a lot of people are just biking, you know, to campus. So where's the bike going to go? Um, when we, I encourage people to kind of flip through the whole template and look at, we have an existing conditions plan. So it shows you what we started with and kind of go through that, the existing conditions into the site analysis and then into the plan to kind of understand where you started and kind of think about that goal um, setting of where you're trying to get to, but thinking about those le le um, levels of functionality that we thought through first, how do you need to use it? How do you want to use it? And, and definitely a, a big goal for us um, on this one was how can we make outdoor living the most comfortable, the most um, appealing to draw you out of the house, draw you into the garden. Um, and so we try to give a lots of different types of ways that you could be in the garden, in the front, in the side, you know, in the back and for each different type, um, uh, each resident to be able to use an individual seat uh, space, but also for the whole to work for everyone. So I would say at, at the first, know your plant, know your place, plan for that place, but also think about who's living there, how they want to live, how best can you support that outdoor living, start setting your goals around that. And that'll start giving you a little bit of cue about, um, okay, I need this type of sitting space. No, um, growing some food is really important to me. I have to go ahead and make um, a space for that. Okay, where's the best sun for that? So I would do that bigger thinking right up front you get your kind of bubble diagram, you know, set. And then from there, then you can start layering, layering in the very specifics about, oh, I have to have this plant. Where, where's the best place I'm gonna put this? So. Thank you. It looks like a beautiful functional space for the residents. Can you tell us more about the plants that you selected and how they also support and preserve plant and wildlife species and, and how the, the garden would change through the seasons as well? Yeah, so definitely we wanted to go for um, not only beauty, beauty and functionality, um, but for each of those different spaces. So starting in the front, um, what we call the verge, some people call the hell strip right against the curb, you know it's going to be hot, you know it's going to be dry, you know there's going to be disturbance there, whether it's people walking by, walking their dog, or, you know, it's the mail carrier, or um, trash, like there's just going to be a little bit of disturbance, you know, in that health strip. The soils are probably going to be lean. They may be a little bit compacted. When I say lean, I mean maybe not the most um, organically rich um, soils in that zone. So we started kind of layering in, you know, assumptions about those particular spaces and fitting the plants to those. So hot and dry, you know, in that front. We know that's facing west. We wanted to make sure we get a tree in there. Um, if you can fit an oak tree into your property, do it. That's one of the highest, best keystone species that you can put in for um, biodiversity. So we, 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 you know, said to ourselves, we have to get an oak tree in here. So that tree right on the curb, that's an oak tree. Um, then we also layered in so that that front sitting space and that view out of that front window would be very comfortable. 
it's not complete privacy, but there's a little bit of screening to make that comfortable for somebody to sit there. So there's an understory tree um, in there. Um, then uh, same on the side garden. Again, like a smaller understory tree. Um, we focus on getting things that are higher level. Um, when I say keystone species, it means that it serves the most amount of wildlife. Um, so oaks are high up on that list. If you Google keystone species, um, you know, specific to your area, you're gonna find a lot of information on that. The plant um, schedule, the plant palette for this template, it lists those. So it'll tell you how many host um, how many different, you know, insects, pollinators that this will provide a host plant for. That's only where it's for a, best, uh, a specialist um, insect or a pollinator. That doesn't even get into the generalist. So I guess kind of know that when you look at the, the plant schedule for this template, you'll be able to see, oh, how is this serving the broader, um, broader ecosystem that's listed there in those numbers. And then we also, you know, really make a point of saying, how is this for human use too? There's definitely things in here that are for human use, whether it's the berries for food, maybe there's some medicinal qualities to some of the plants um, besides just the beauty um, aspect. So I hope I answered your question. I babbled on. You did, yes. <laughs> but I do have another question because I, I, that's so helpful for the oak tree. That um, percus that you selected, what, how large does that get? I'm thinking about in this type of uh, environment. Um, that's a willow oak um, there, and it can be at least 40, 50 uh, feet tall. It can be taller. I guess one thing that when you look up a, a plant like that, you may be finding information on if it's living its best life. And I would say that any street tree probably not living its best life just because the the soil that it's in may be compacted and may not be getting as much water you know as it wants the soils may be a little bit lean so just like um you know I can be different than my cousin or even you know my brother my sister um you know the height may vary a little bit you know depending on the site that you put it in so for a street tree um, as a willow oak I would definitely count on it being at least 40 50 feet tall but I wouldn't ever expect it to be the, the champion, um, champion willow oak tree. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, I think some shy away from planting oaks in small areas because of some of the uh, varieties that are so large. Absolutely. And I think that we get to, you know, to where we think about um, the pin oak, you know, being the quintessential, you know, um, street tree, oak tree. There's so many oak trees. You can branch out. You don't have to pick a, um, a pin oak. And definitely for the New Jersey area, you can look at the Pine Barrens um, as an example for you because there are a couple of smaller um, oak trees that are indicative um, or indigenous to the Pine Barrens. So when you think about oak, yes, some of them are big stately trees, not all of them. You might be able to find another oak tree that fits your space. Excellent. Okay. The plants that you selected for the design are native to the Mid-Atlantic Princeton region. I wanted to share that Wild Ones currently has three new chapters in New Jersey. The New Jersey Skylands Seedling Chapter covers Mercer and other northern counties. The Southern New Jersey Seedling Chapter covers some of the coastal southern counties. And the New Jersey Gateway Chapter is based in the densely populated Hudson County. Can you share how, if this design might be adapted to other parts of the state? Absolutely, absolutely. And it may be you picking just a little small piece, you know, from this template and making again, fit your site. So um, whether you have something that's more like that, that front yard where it's kind of blasting with afternoon sun, it may be drier, um, you know, really well-drained, you know, um, sandy loam, silty loam um, soil, maybe pick something that's just a little piece of that front yard or just a little piece of that side yard. If you have um, a little spot that maybe you've got shade from neighboring trees or something, maybe you wanna only pick a little tiny bit of the backyard um, closer to the fire pit area. So I would definitely say there are pieces um, within this where you can only take out that little piece and apply it to your specific conditions, your particular amount of space um, that you have. And even if you only have um, space for containers, 
there's definitely some um, uh, perennial, herbaceous perennial um, combinations in here where you could just take a couple of those and have that in a container. Um, so I would definitely say you could look at this broadly, take it, you know, in pieces and, and fit that to the amount of space um, and conditions that you have. Yeah, it's nice to know that those in um, more an urban environment, even without a quarter acre, balconies, patios, small outdoor areas can also use native plants and container plantings. Absolutely. I don't have a true front yard um, where I live. I live in a quite urban um, setting, and I've done a lot with native plants in containers, um, you know, in my street tree, you know, verge um, planting. So Definitely, you don't need to think that all you can fit in there are annuals. Um, there's a lot of opportunity where you can get in um, containers and it might even open um, opportunities for you to collaborate with your neighbors or collaborate with your local park group. Because sometimes I've been like, oh, I have this great um, native perennial in a container, but oh, you know what, it's getting a little tired, you know, in that container, try it, you know, maybe time to switch it out. It, it feels like it wants to, you know, spread its feet, you know, a little bit. I might be able to work with my local park group and kind of donate that plant to the local park group. It can live on. I can change out something in my um, in my planter. So sometimes those smaller spaces, the containers, they'll, they'll allow you for a little bit more switch out. They'll allow you for more seasonal change, but you don't have to think about it as trash. You can share it with your gardening club, you know, kind of like a plant swap. You can share, it, you know, with your local park, things like that. Those are great ideas. Um, looking at the site itself and this specific type of property, what are some of the things that needed to be considered prior to even planting? So yes, if you look at within the package that we've shared at the site analysis page and the existing conditions and compare that to the site analysis, you'll get a cue of where to start looking. So a lot of places have um, a pretty blank slate um, like this one. This one was a blank slate with a lot of asphalt paving and a lot of lawn. And so it gave a lot of opportunity. So you can look at that and start understanding what are my sun and shade patterns, especially if you're in an urban um, area the buildings may be casting, you know, a lot of shade. Um, and that's gonna change, you know, from June to December. The, the sun's gonna be much lower um, in the sky, you know, in the winter time. So really watch those sun and shade patterns throughout the seasons, understand that. Um, understand where um, water can soak in or where it can't, um, you know, if it's, if it's an asphalt paving, things like that. Understanding those opportunities of the soils, the, where the water can go, where the sun um, can go. That's the basics um, of where to start. And then from there, back to what I was saying about kind of planning your goals and the type of garden you want, then you can start layering in how to start change, making changes on um, adding to from there. Lisa, it makes sense when you describe that blank slate perhaps being a large amount of asphalt um, or concrete or something, especially in an urban environment. Do you often recommend swapping that out for uh, permeable? Uh, are, there, are there other in the patio areas that you designed in this? Is that a specific um, intention or a selection that you make? Absolutely, because we have um, a good amount of rainfall um, in our area, and it's only increasing absolutely where you can encourage um, infiltration of stormwater, do it. And I'll say that um, many places um, in our area, you're gonna get grant opportunities, um, tax credit um, things. Um, where I live, we have a stormwater fee charge, you know, that if you have too much um, hard surfaces on your property, you get an extra charge from the water department um, because you're contributing to more water is going into the sewers. Um, so I would definitely say, look at that, have as minimal paving as you absolutely need for the function and usability. So that was definitely like a big opportunity that we saw from the beginning of this is there was way too much pavement. And again, a lot of people look at grass and pavement as like the easiest to maintain, and that may not be true. Um, so don't use either of those, whether, um, 
whether it's concrete or asphalt um, or grass, don't use them as a carpet. Use them only where you need for functionality, for circulation, or for play. Other than that, turn it into a beautiful garden. Use every inch you have. <laughs> Great reminder. So soils vary from location to location. I'm not uh, familiar with the Princeton area so much, but what soil composition did you observe for the design? And based on that, do you normally suggest any soil amendments or preparation before planting? Um, definitely, I would say absolutely start with a soil test um, of your area and it's gonna change. Um, so, you know, if you went and took a soil test in this area and you took it within the grass, it's gonna be different than if you start ripping up asphalt and test the soil under there. So you may need to do, for sure do a soil test, but you may need to do more than one, even within a small property, just for from different uses of that, you know, actual spot. Um, that we've put in the um, resources list, um, a great resource, the Cornell um, lab for soil testing. Um, and the, the reason why we selected that one is because it not only tells you the, the chemical properties, um, things like the type of soil, whether you have um, a silty loam or a clay loam, um, the pH of the soil, uh, organic content, that's kind of a basic soil test that you could do. The interesting thing about the Cornell one is it also gives you a little bit more clue into the biology that's happening. Um, so the, the different um, um, fungal bacterial um, correlations between the kind of living part of the soil um, that's happening. So you could absolutely do a standard basic um, soil test. You could use the Rutgers um, lab for that. If you wanted that next layer up to understand the living side of soil, you could use that Cornell lab. So for the soils that we assumed here, again, because it's been in the urban area for a long time, we're, we are assuming it's been developed maybe multiple times, it's been developed for a long time. So there's gonna be a little bit of urban soils um, to this site, but we um, assumed that the base is like a, a silty loam to a clay loam. That's, that's very standard across the Princeton area. The Princeton area is gonna change a little bit. Again, I think I said this earlier, if you're more on a ridge versus if you're in a valley, um, maybe you have a little bit more silty sandy loam if you're in the valley versus you might have more of that clay loam exposed if you're on the ridge. If you're closer to a waterway, if you're starting to get closer, um, there's several waterways in and around Princeton. If you're getting closer to those waterways, that may affect your soil um, a little bit. So do the test, know your spot. Great advice. And it looks like you're also recommending um, capturing rainfall with rain barrels or, or other means. Do you know if that's something that's commonly practiced in Princeton in that type of environment? Absolutely. Most of the um, municipalities, cities in the Mid-Atlantic region are going to have, um, they're going to encourage you to do that. They may fine you if you don't do that. Um, and like I said earlier, there may be ways that you get a tax credit, um, you know, for putting in something like that. So um, Princeton did enact um, a climate policy. I think it was in 2019. So definitely if you're in the Princeton area, take a look at that, see the opportunities that the city um, and, and local nonprofits um, are supporting, see where you can plug into that um, and how that again may be not only applicable um, to to your site, um, but where that may change finances again, whether you get a tax credit or if you're getting fee if you're not taking care of that stormwater. In this particular one, we took care of the stormwater in a couple of ways. The easiest way was the rain barrels, which you just connect to the the downspout leaders from your roof. Um, that helps in a couple of ways. It will collect the water so that you can reuse it for watering the garden. Um, as needed. But the other thing it does is it just delays um, the kind of surge of water after a bigger storm. So you could use that rain barrel to just hold it for a little while. You could release it slowly after a big rain, or again, you could use it for, for watering the plants for irrigation. So that was a big way. And that was usually, um, I would say that that's maybe the first way that you could look at it because it's easy to install, it's pretty affordable to install, and then it's use. You're not, you know, pulling water out of, you know, paying for water to, to water the plants. Um, and then the second way was that um, 
changing as much um, hard surfaces over to permeable surfaces, whether that's with a type of permeable paving or switching it from a hard surface into a garden. That's great. I think there's a, um, I don't know if it's Master Gardeners or one of the organizations local to me, they offer rain barrel workshops and you can actually go and build your own and take it home and they show you how to hook it up and everything. So it is becoming right. much more accessible. Right, and there's there's so many ways you could use, whether it's kind of like an old um, olive barrel kind of thing, you know, you can get things that you could repurpose and reuse that way. There's other ways, you know, where you can buy it off the shelf and it's specifically made for that. Um, definitely a lot of ways that, yeah, you could use something that already exists and repurpose it or build something specific, buy something specific just for that. Uh, sticking with the, um, still site preparation a bit. Your designer notes touch on how to prepare the landscape and you reference lasagna gardening. Can you share with us what the advantages are of that particular process um, and, and why you use it? Yes, so um, unfortunately the, um, the video doesn't show the design um, a lot. So I would definitely encourage people, even if you need to pause this for a little bit, print out that um, set that we've um, provided and use that um, to really go through in detail and start making your plan. So first, what you're gonna need to do before you even kind of get to soil uh, site preparation is understanding what you're doing where um, and understanding the phasing you know, that you need to do. And I definitely encourage people as you're building a garden, definitely phase it in. Don't assume that you're doing it all at one time um, just because sometimes uh, a couple of reasons. You're going to learn as you go. You're going to learn what's working at your site. Um, you're going to learn more about yourself. How are you as a gardener? You know, it's kind of like the gym. You know, you maybe make the intention that you're going to go there four days a week, but then as life happens, you know, you make it there less. So gardening can be a little bit like that too. Sometimes it can be that that piece that you think you're going to have this amount of time for, but as life happens, you have less. So start with knowing what you're putting where. Start by phasing, um, and I would say bite it in little chunks, you know, at first until you start to really get to know your place and know yourself um, as a gardener. So once you've kind of de decided for yourself what is phase one, mark it out. Um, you can do that in a couple of ways. It could be spray paint. You could use a garden hose, but kind of mark out that phase one for yourself. And then depending on what is in that place, whether it's, you know, um, pavement that you're moving or the lasagna um, gardening is really for something where you're transitioning from one plant type to another. So most typically from lawn or grass into a garden bed. Um, so lasagna um, gardening um, is kind of just, a, it's a, a low expense um, way to, trans, to transform a garden space. And it's also like pretty easy on you physically. Um, I wouldn't say it's back breaking work. Like if you tried to, treat you know change a, bar, a, a lawn area and tr and treat it like you're gonna like like take off the first layer um like it's like sod farm like you're making sod that's pretty like physical um physically intense you know work to do but if you do the lasagna gardening um you let time kind of help you um as a trade-off to the physical um aspects so um lasagna gardening can be you put down something as simple as newspaper or cardboard, um, you put that down as the first layer and then you layer over three, four, maybe more, um, some type of mulch. Um, a lot of um, arborists um, will give away free wood chips. Um, so sometimes that can be a free resource um, for people. Um, if you just you know call a local arborist and, and ask if they'll dump off a load of wood chips. Um, you wanna ask for clean chips um, if you do that. A lot of um, municipalities um, may offer that as a free resource as well. So it could be wood chips, it could be leaves, but you wanna give something a little bit more solid at the base, whether it's newspaper or cardboard, and then put some type of organic um, material over the top, usually wood chips, mulch, leaves, something like that. And then you just let, let time work for you. So basically what you've done is you've blocked the sun out. The, the plants can't transpire, you know, anymore with, you know, without any sunlight, so they die off. So you're probably going to need to at least allow that to sit for two months 
Um, but check it, you can kind of pull back those layers, check it, make sure that grass is really dying off. Um, you don't wanna skimp on the time when you're first setting up a garden. You really wanna make sure you've killed off whatever plants you don't want there anymore, whether it's weeds, whether it's lawn, let the extra time go into that beginning and it'll save you time and effort um, on the back end. So make sure you kill that all off before you start putting in the things that you want. And then hopefully you'll do a lot less weeding once you get in those desirable plants if you've really allowed the time to kill off the undesirable stuff before you put in the new stuff. It's a great suggestion for preparation. You talked a bit about um, let's minimize turf lawn and concrete and asphalt to you know, functional needs only. And there are many properties and homeowners who residents, even in a dwelling like this, who do still want to maintain some level of turf lawn for recreation. Can you share a bit about your mowing suggestion here on how to at least um, minimize the, the work and maintenance involved there? Absolutely. So um, absolutely understandable. I, I don't want it to make it sound like, you know, like I'm acting like, you know, grass terrible. I would just say, use it where you need it. Um, use it where you want to play, whether it's you, whether it's your dog, totally understand. It's a functional piece of the landscape. Um, so wherever you need to maintain it, whether it's for the long term or if it's just for the short term, if it's just I've only started phase one and I still have the whole, you know, backyard um, that's going to come in phase two or something like that. Um, and you need to keep that lawn, you know, for a certain amount of time. Um, basically, you need to, to, to switch your idea of mowing to responding to the season, responding to the grass growth. So you never, when you're, when you have a lawn, you don't ever want to say it's every two weeks because it's not for the, for the different points of the season, it's not going to follow that type of human um, schedule. So I would say respond to the growth of the grass. Um, and if you, basically when you mow, you only want to take off a third of the blade. You never want to, you know, let it grow really long and then scalp it. You're, you're really um, depleting the plants. Um, that way. So if it's a lawn that you want to keep, you don't want to do that. Um, but if you let it grow a little bit, um, a little bit taller, say three and a half, four inch of a blade, only take off a third, you know, maybe you're keeping that, the, the lawn growth around like a three inch height. Um, that's going to shade the roots. Um, it'll um, not work through uh, water as quickly um, that way. Also, it'll create a little bit more shade so that if a weed seed does come in, it's maybe not getting um, the light that it needs to really germinate. So um, yeah, shift shift your lawn mowing to watching the height of the grass and responding um, to that. Never more than a third of the blade. Try and keep the length three and a half um, to four inches. Um, just go with a little bit of a mind shift on that. That's helpful. I personally live um, in this region and would love to have alternatives to turf lawn, even though I do believe that, you know, having some amount for functional, whether it's human or animal use is helpful. But can you recommend, Lisa, any native grasses or ground covers that for the areas that we would like to minimize turf lawn, lawn are successful in this area? Absolutely. And one thing I meant to say on the last one is in our area, we've started to talk a lot, a lot about no mow may. Um, and so in your area, you know, you may be getting that. And the, the effort behind that is to allow um, a food source for early pollinators. So as I was saying of shifting it away from a human schedule, you know, um, you could look at, you know, taking care of the plants, but also taking care of the pollinators um, with a turf grass. And I guess that I would say, Again, a shift in mindset is it's not necessarily going to be a, a golf course green. Um, allow several different species of plants to be operating within that lawn. And that's going to give you the most resilience um, for the functionality of the lawn, whether it's coming, um, standing up to the use um, that you're giving it, if your dog digs, things like that. If you get a little bit more diversity in there, it's going to be good for the, the human use of it. 
it's going to be good for the um, pollinators. So um, I'll just give a shout out to the Mount Cuba um, Public Garden um, just across the border into Delaware, um, not that far from the Princeton area. Um, it's a beautiful public garden. Go and visit. You can get so many ideas there. But the great thing that Mount Cuba does for all of us is they do plant trials. Um, and so one of the plant trials that they were running um, in, the, in the summer of 2022 um, was for a lot of sedges. Um, sedges look like grass, um, but a little bit, little bit different plant, um, but they overall will have a, a look like grass. So Mount Cuba will be publishing their research um, that they did on the trial for the different um, sedge species. So, so watch for that. Um, they did them both in more sunny conditions, more shade, more water, less water. And they even did a trial with mowing them, not mowing them. But overall, a sedge will stay a shorter, um, shorter height dimension. Um, many of them can be 12 inches or less. So they'll have that grass-like look. So I would say when you're doing a lawn replacement, look to your sedges. Um, it's a big, big family. You can have a lot of different species that'll, that'll play with sun to shade, less water, more water. Um, within the plant list for this um, design, we've given you a few ideas um, for some alternatives um, to lawn. Uh, we mentioned a, a particular um, sedge, the social sedge. Um, we also say let the violets uh, live within the lawn. Don't think that that's something that you need to take the herbicide to let the violets be in there. Um, but anyway, there's many different native um, ground covers, um, some that will stand up to foot traffic um, a little bit more, but you have lots of options. But I would start probably with the sedges and watch for that Mount Cuba uh, research to be published. Thank you. I will do so on that. Um, one of the questions I have, you provided the list of trees and shrubs to be planted in the designer notes. Can you share more about why you might wanna start with planting the trees ahead of any of the other uh, plants in the landscape? Absolutely, two reasons. One, woody plants, um, trees, they're slower growing um, than a grass or a, an herbaceous perennial, right? So you want to just kind of jump that timeline a little bit. Let those go in first to just get those growing. Um, the second reason is oftentimes the woody plants, the, the, the shrubs in the trees are providing the structure for your garden. So if you get those in first, you're going to go ahead and start setting up that structure. Um, and a lot of times they're we talk about them, I guess, being keystones, you know, in a couple of ways, they're keystones from a biodiversity um, standpoint, but they can also be keystones from the structural standpoint in your garden, that you're making the big moves first, and then you start layering and building in around those bigger elements, such as the, such as the trees. Thank you. I understand as well that many of our native plants have really deep root systems. What are the benefits from planting natives with that kind of root structure? Um, you can definitely uh, research this, you know, online for the different types of root structures that different plants provide. Um, but I would say that what you, as, as much as you want to layer the plants above the ground, you want to do the same below the ground. So a lot of plants such as the, you know, sedges, they're gonna have a very fibrous uh, root system. So that's gonna be higher in the soil profile, really dense network um, fanning out, you know, compared to say a taproot tree, um, like, a, like a sassafras or something like that. So as you think about layering above ground, layer below ground, take up all that space. You can do the fibrous root systems and the higher in the profile and you can get some deep rooted um, things to go a little bit deeper. But the reason why you want to do that is a um, couple of reasons, um, stability um, of the soil and being able to access that water. So maybe the water, if we're going through a little bit of a drought um, uh, season, like we did this past summer, those deep rooted things are maybe accessing different water sources, um, depending on where you are within the water table in your area. Um, also, if you're in a, uh, if you have a, a, a site condition similar to this um, urban multifamily, it's been developed a long time. Maybe it was formerly um, pavement like asphalt. Maybe it's highly compacted. So if you get in more deep rooted things, you're um, 
breaking up that soil compaction. You're letting roots do the work for you to break up that soil compaction. Um, the, 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 the plants will do that, you know, work for you. They're opening up um, kind of um, access ways within the soil for the water to penetrate and really get down in and recharge. Um, and then you're opening up the air exchange um, as well with deeper rooted, um, intensely rooted uh, plants. That's good to know. I um, always gardened as my mother did, <laughs> she's British. So I was always gardening based on bringing in the non-natives and the exotics. The, it's, it was all I knew before I learned about native plants. And there was always a specific gardening time around Mother's Day every year. And um, that's when you know we were told to put the plants out. And I came to learn that that was because they really weren't hardy. And it seems like you're helping us to shift our intention from or you know our idea about planting in the spring to planting in the fall with our native plants. Can you share a bit about why that is so helpful to shift our planting time frame to the fall? Yes, I think it's going to be easier on you and I think it's going to be um, more beneficial to the plant. So like you said, that I think it's just kind of in our cultural mind that, oh, spring is gardening time, but I would encourage you to shift to fall is the time to plant. Um, and also a lot of people, a lot of people do like a big fall cleanup. I would say do that in the spring. So you kind of want to take the, the cultural norms of planting and kind of, you know, transfer the knowledge from, you know, what's expected in spring to fall and, and likewise. So um, what happens when you plant in fall? And I would go as early in fall as possible. So September can still be quite warm um, here. So, but if I start to think like, all right, I'm going to target end of September, early October as like my main, you know, big scale planting time for the year, what you're doing is it's still warm enough. You still have enough sunlight where the, the roots are starting to get some establishment, but the temperatures are starting to be um, less. So the, the, the plant isn't having to work um, as hard, but you're also getting that root establishment. So yeah, if you get the plants in, in early fall, root establishment before you get back to those 90 degree temperatures um, next summer. So you're just giving the plant a leg up in establishment. Um, and like I said, it's gonna be easier on you. You're gardening in that great weather um, in the fall and you're not having to think about you know, being out there to water just to get the plants through establishment, you're, you're working with the season a little bit more, letting just the typical weather pattern, uh, you're working with the typical weather pattern instead of kind of fighting against it. So if you started to think about, oh, my big planting, you know, is at Mother's Day, it's starting to get warmer, you're already a little bit past those spring rainy um, times. So you're going to maybe be out there in hotter weather and watering. So that's why um, we definitely suggest Think about the bigger moves of planting in the fall. Of course, you can plant anytime the ground is not frozen. Um, so I'm not trying to discourage planting from you know other times of year. I'm just saying the bigger planting effort that you're doing, think about fall. That's great. I availability of native plants is is getting tougher as the demand increases. Um, as you also own. Redbud Native Plant Nursery, do you find that there's still a great stock and selection and availability in the fall for people to shift more to that planting season? Absolutely. And I would say work with the sources that are near you. Let them know your intention. And then they're going to want your business. They want you as a customer. They'll work with you. So if you know that you're going to do a bigger effort come fall, be in touch with them in June, July and say, hey, I'm going to do this bigger planting in the fall. Can I make sure that you're going to have these things available? Just plan ahead, work with your local sources um, ahead of time. And this kind of gets into um, the, the type or the, the size of plants that you may be putting in. So it's going to depend on, are you trying to buy a bigger plant? Um, and plants, you know, a bigger containerized plant, you know, right at establishment versus working with seeds. So first, you're going to have to kind of think about that a little bit. Do you want to be 
um, working with, with seeds. And then you've got to go through the germination and the plants being small versus getting a, a number one, which is similar to a one gallon, you know, perennial or a number three um, shrub. So first decide the amount of um, immediacy, you know, that you're looking for with those types of plants and then start to talk with uh, your local suppliers, your local growers, and see what kind of plan you can make around the timing um, that you're looking for. But definitely you should you'd have plenty available in our area um, in the fall. And um, like I said, I think that you could work out, you know, a specialized order, um, whether it's with your local retail um, plant establishment, um, something like if you were trying to get a bigger tree, maybe that's gonna be bigger than you can handle um, in your, in your, you know, personal vehicle or just, um, physicality of getting that bigger plant in. And maybe then you would, um, want to work with a landscape contractor. So there's several different ways you could do it, whether it's DIY completely on your own, and you're working with seeds and small plants, small plug starts, things like that, versus working with a bigger, um, containerized, um, plant. You, you can kind of run that gamut, do what's right for you talk with a contractor, talk with the sources and um, put in an order if you need to. Excellent. Okay, also in your designer notes, um, you referenced green mulch. Can you share with us a bit more about what the options are for mulching and containing weeds in a newly planted garden? Absolutely, so um, I would say that it could be kind of standard culturally to expect that you've got one plant and it's in a big area of mulch. Um, and I'll tell you as a gardener, that is setting yourself up for a lot of work <laughs> because anytime that you have open soil, even if it's covered with mulch, that's just a spot where a weed can come in and get established. So you're, you're creating a lot more weeding for yourself if you don't go ahead and put in um, plants that are desirable um, to you. And another point is to understand gardens are dynamic. They're going to change a lot through their life cycle. If you think about a puppy is very different than your eight-year-old dog, that's what a garden is like. And you have to work with it like that. Ex expect um, it to be dynamic, expect it to evolve, expect it to change. So when you're putting in this new garden, and again, this is back to um, the, the last um, question about sizing of plants. If you're putting in um, really small plants um, because that's what's available to you, those are the resources you wanna spend on it, you might have open bare soil you know, for a bit of time until those plants really get established and start to take off. So you could use several different types of um, mulch materials. And again, it, you know, it could depend on budget. It could depend on the view, you know, the, the aesthetic, um, that you like, but I encourage a lot of people to think about green mulch, which just means a living plant. So if I've gone, gone ahead and put in the, the bigger shrub, that bigger tree, because I was, you know, trying to get those woody plants in first, trying to get those structural elements in first, but I can't install the rest of the garden, you know, for a time, you could put in um, shredded leaves, you could put in bark mulch, but just expect to be weeding um, if you're doing that. I definitely do not at all um, encourage things like a weed fabric. Um, those always wind up being way more worth it. They, 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 they get sold telling you that it's gonna save you work. No, they're way more work in the end because what happens is basically you've just created soil on top of them once you put mulch on it and that starts to build up and weeds can go on top of them just as much as they can you know, not come through them. And then it's a lot of work to rip that out. So I would stay away from anything like that. But yeah, so um, with the different mulch types, you are going to be holding water in. You're going to be um, keeping some amount of weeds down. But if you could put a green plant, a living plant in instead, um, that's going to be taking up that soil space. It's going to start to make um, you know, organic matter, start to do that exchange between the soil um, and the top of the top of the garden. Um, so a green mulch is just any kind of other ground cover type um, plant that can be temporary. Back to that dynamism and evolution, allow your garden to change. So in our area, there are a lot of sources for plug 
plant. Um, a deep cell plug might, you know, have four inch root system, you know, but the top is quite small. It looks like a, a, a starter plant. Um, so if you want to cover a big area economically, again, easy on your back, easy digging, you could do something like a plug of a ground cover. So that could be back to those sedges um, that we talked about. Um, it could be something like strawberry. Um, that could be another lovely um, ground cover um, that will, you know, take over quickly, cover the ground quickly. Um, that could be one, you know, for a really sunny spot. So there's there's a lot of opportunities if you go through the plant list. Um, in this template, it'll give you some ideas um, for the green mulch, um, a lot of um, alternates with the things that we've suggested for, you know, temporary lawn uh, replacement, um, things like that. So yeah, violet, sedges, strawberries. Um, there's even a sedum um, that's a native sedum. Um, that's a great option for um, the living mulch, the green mulch. And then just expect that that is, um, can be temporary as those other plants mature, they might start to crowd them out, they might start to shade them out, but they are just kind of a sacrificial level uh, layer that can change um, over time. And it even can be something, again, if you did it really economically, whether by seeds or what by plugs, you don't feel so guilty pulling that out over time as you start to implement, you know, the more full garden um, that you want. Great. Are any of the ground cover green mulch options that you recommended evergreen or semi evergreen? Yes. Um, again, the sedges are a big, big family, and there are many of those that are semi evergreen. Um, there are definitely some that are evergreen, so that might just take a little bit of research um, on your part. And again, watch for that Mount Cuba study to come out because I'm sure that'll be one thing that's listed there. Um, but you can definitely get things um, that have an evergreen quality. There are even um, herbaceous um, perennial ground covers um, like Tiarella. Um, they're technically not evergreen, but they have enough of what's called basil leaves um, that are left um, in the winter. The basil leaves are the ones right where the crown of the plant is, is coming out. Um, so we have some, um, some foam flower is the common name. Tiarella is the botanical Latin name. Um, near our um, office door, and it's looking great um, right now. And we're definitely in winter. Okay, let's talk a bit about um, planning and phasing. Many homeowners or residents may not have the resources to install a garden of this size all at once. Um, are there phased approaches you can recommend as resources time allow? Definitely. So if you go into the um, the, the garden design um, package that we've supplied, we give an idea of um, ideas for phase one, phase two over different years. And like I was saying before, I would I would encourage everybody to take your time. Don't don't assume that this is you're putting it all in at once. Um, like I said, just because things are going to evolve, you're going to you're going to grow in your knowledge and experience. Um, so work with that. So definitely, I encourage people to, to phase it in, even if you did have the budget to put it all in at once, because your experience is going to change. Knowing your site is going to change as you start to actively um, work it. So I would start with um, a phase one being something that's going to do high impact for you right from the beginning, kind of get a win. Uh, under your belt, whether that's, um, you know, the easy things like, um, like the rain barrels or um, going ahead and putting in those structural plants like that oak tree, you know, out front. Maybe you want to um, decide your phasing, whether it's an eco a quick ecological benefit um, or a quick beauty benefit. Maybe you're going to say, you know what, every day when I come home and I walk up these front stairs, I really want to be welcomed welcomed home by the beauty of the garden. So maybe you pick, you know, a spot that you go by every day to be a phase one. Um, so know yourself, know your site. And I think that's going to help you kind of start to, to break the garden into, you know, bite-sized pieces um, in a way and help you understand what the phasing um, approach is best for you. Um, but like I said, there there is um, within the, the package that we provided an idea of phasing, um, we kind of went with, you know, those quick wins, maybe what's going to be a, um, an ecosystem function, you know, quick win about changing things over from 
whether there was an invasive plant there or whether it was all lawn and a spot that was right up front was going to change the beauty. Um, we picked that front garden, you know, to be phase one, but know your site, know yourself. And I think that's going to help you break yours up into those um, in discrete um, phases. Yeah, and I love the idea about um, here on the slide, the wood chips or mulch being used for paths or sitting areas before um, permeable paving can be quite expensive. So maybe that's not where someone wants to first invest. Maybe get some of that beauty you described at the common entry way or, or something instead. That's, that's a great idea. Absolutely. There's like that, that, um, you know, they can be low resource intensive. Like I said, you can call your local arborist and see if you can get that for free, call your municipality, see if that's for free. Um, even with that amount of asphalt that we're recommending, you know, be taken out of this garden, you may not have to do that all at once. Maybe you leave the asphalt where the cars are going to park, but you take out the asphalt where you want to get a garden established. So even something like that can be broken into you know, two phases. You only take out the part that you need for the garden to begin with. You can switch over the rest of it to a permeable paving you know, later on. But definitely there's um, alternate um, surfaces that you could use um, that don't have to be the final you know, right from the beginning, whether that's pea gravel, whether that's um, wood chips, things like that. All of those are readily available, economical to begin with. Thank you, Lisa. You've shared such helpful information with us today. Is there anything else that you would like to share that we haven't touched on? Yeah, I want to go back to what you were talking about, being, um, being your mother's daughter. <laughs> I want to say that um, being a native plant gardener doesn't have to be completely black and white, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You know what, if your mother had um, this beautiful rose or this, you know, beautiful whatever plant that has a lot of meaning to you, I wouldn't say that you need to excommunicate that, you know, from, from your garden, from things that you love. Go ahead and allow those things to be um, incorporated. I would say that um, shoot for a percentage. Um, have your garden be at least 70% native. Try and go for 100% if you can, but if there are those things that are just have cultural um, uh, reference for you or you know things like I was saying, like your mother loved this and it reminds you of your mother, don't think that you have to get rid of that you know, in your garden. Um, I would say just don't, when you do that percentage, you know, for yourself, just think about nothing that's going to cause harm. So I wouldn't, you know, go ahead and then include something that can be a native, a, a, an invasive plant um, in your area. Um, so once you've decided it's not bad for anything, you know, allow that, you know, into your garden. Um, the other thing is talk with your neighbors, work with your neighbors. Um, I think that a lot of times people think that a native plant garden means that it looks wild. That doesn't have to be the case. That can be all in how you plan it, implement it, and then maintain it. So you could still have a structured garden, a beautiful garden, but it's with native plants. Um, there's different ways um, that you can, like I said, um, plant, but then take care of it. So there's something called the Chelsea Chop, <laughs> and that's a reference to the Chelsea Flower Show. But um, the Chelsea Chop can give you um, ways that may make your garden, again, more appealing to your, you know, ways that your mother gardened or ways that your neighbors are gardening. Um, and what that allows you to do is it may allow you, so say you have um, a plant border and you're using something like a bee balm that might get four feet tall and your neighbors are like, I don't know, this is looking a little wild. You can kind of do a fade. <laughs> the, the fade is not only for the haircut. Um, you can do that in the garden too, to where you can cut um, the front of that border to be a little bit um, shorter. And then you can allow the taller, you know, the true tallness of the bee balm to be in the back. So what that's gonna do is give you kind of a neat edge, it's gonna give you intentionality. You're gonna show cues of care um, and how you're maintaining it. But the benefit of that too is anything that you um, cut um, before July 4th, don't cut it after July 4th or you're gonna sacrifice the flower. But if you do that, you know, Mother's Day, 
something like that. What's going to happen is the thing that you, the bee bomb that you left taller in the back is going to bloom first. But what you've done at the beginning where you've cut that is you've um, delayed the bloom a little bit. So you're going to get a really long bloom time um, out of that native plant by managing it um, that way. So that's to the point of do the garden that's right for you, that speaks to you, that's beautiful for you. You don't need to excommunicate, you know, all plants um, that have a, a history um, with you and then um, plan on managing it in the way that shows your neighbors, works with your neighbors for what they're expecting to see, what they expect on the border of your lawn, your yard next to their lawn. Um, that can all be in the, the cues of care, the management, but work with your work with your neighbors, talk with them about what you're doing, why you're doing it. And then you might kind of get a bigger coalition um, going and you're, you know, be able to kind of change over, you know, street by street um, in your area. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I had one other thing. Thank you for all that. Um, in your bio, the last statement was, and I'll just share the end again, and a wide range of design professionals and private homeowners in cultivating landscapes like our health depends on it. Can you talk a bit more about that, Lisa? Absolutely. Thank you for um, calling attention to that. So I think that with climate change, um, we can look at things in, in a bigger, broader scope. Um, and, and think about ways that we want to be working in our private space to be working on, on a larger global um, issue like climate change. Um, so definitely that's a piece of our health in the current day and in the future. But the other thing for me is um, gardening is just feeds my soul. Um, you know, it just, it really makes me like really healthy on the emotional spiritual um, planes um, for me. So there's really um, the, the, the distinct, you know, physical attributes that you can be working on climate change, whether it's cooling the temperatures um, right at your house, um, not having to, you know, use so much electricity for your, um, for your air conditioner in the summer. There's, there's very simple, basic ways that are that. But um, for me, the health goes to the other levels of personal health. Uh, whether it's physical fitness because you're out there gardening a little bit, but definitely for me, it's um, it's the mental and spiritual um, work that I need on a regular basis too. So it's feeding me that way too. And I think that I, I think that a lot of people during the um, during the pandemic started to really understand that um, when you have that healthy, beautiful space right outside your door, um, it, it's really feeding you, making you comfortable making you feel safe and secure. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I myself find that when I'm gardening, I don't think, I don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's almost like a movement meditation. So okay. yeah, that's wonderful. Okay, well, thank you um, thank so you. much for sharing your vision and expertise in the development of this design and walking us through it today. Lisa's Urban Multifamily Dwelling Princeton Design, Plant List, Designer Notes, and a list of regional native plant nurseries can be found online at nativegardendesigns.wildones.org. Also, uh, feedback on this webinar helps us to continually improve our programs. We ask that you do take a short survey after viewing. And thank you again, Lisa, for joining us. We thank hope you. that those who are, oh, thank you so much. And we hope that those watching feel inspired and empowered to plant more native plants in their communities. Have a wonderful day.